Good afternoon. My name is Marsha McAdam. Um, I'd like to welcome you to this um, Royal College of Psychiatry webinar um, titled Criminalising Distress, um, which is part of a wider Tale of Three Cities Goes Global, which is part of International Borderline Personality Disorder Awareness Month. So my name is Marsha McAdam and um, I'm a mental health um, advocate an ambassador and peer consultant for the Centre for Mental Health. And I myself um, identify as having borderline personality disorder. Um, and the reason I say that is because that diagnosis meant that I got life-changing therapy, uh, which saved me from myself. Um, and over the last few years, I've tried to um, began conversations and so um, I'm going to be co-chairing this webinar uh, with Dr Adrian James and um, I'd like to give you a quick um, reason about why this tale of three cities sta started so in September 2020 I partnered up with Professor Peter Fonagay who's chief exec of the Anna Freud Centre and Sarah Hughes, who's chief exec of the Centre for Mental Health. We were really concerned around the stigma that often comes with a diagnosis of personality disorders. We convened a series of roundtable discussions with key stakeholders, including most importantly, those with lived experience. And Adrian was one um, of those uh, members um, that joined. And um, I've been lucky enough that Adrian, um, from outside the, the webinar or the round tables, he has, um, I've had one-to-one -one meetings and he really wants to know a bit about what he can do um, as um, in his role going forward around the stigma that does often come with his diagnosis. Um, or these diagnoses, because it's not just borderline personality disorder, it's the wider ones. So um, I guess um, A Tale of Three Cities was a small webinar last year of young people from 42nd Street, the Anna Freud Centre and Forward Thinking Birmingham. Now, I chaired the webinar and it was just small. It was 30 people involved and um, it was the young people that were talking about what was good and what was not so good about services. And they were leading the conversation as by experts by experience. And then along came the experts by occupation or they supported the conversation. Um, and I, I, at the debrief afterwards, the young people wanted an all day event and an all person, an, an all day event and an in-person event. So this is what we're doing this year. Um, but because I could only get a venue for a few hours at the end of the month, we decided to um, hold a series of webinars, both uh, virtually and in-person events. Um, and the collaboration is between the Anna Freud Centre, the Centre for Mental Health, 42nd Street and Forward Thinking Birmingham. Now, I, um, like I say, I approached Adrian to see whether he would uh, collaborate with us. And he said yes straight away and give him his due. Uh, his topic was around criminalizing distress because it was something that he was very mindful of. Um, so while it is a very emotive subject, and if I'm completely honest with you, I'm a bit anxious about doing this webinar because it is a very delicate subject and I, as an expert by experience, can talk about my lived experience and another expert by experience will talk about her experiences of services. Um, and then we've got experts by occupation, Alex, uh, Adrian, and then Sarah. Um, and you'll hear from them about their various areas. So please, can I ask you to be really respectful about this, this uh, conversation and um, I also wanted to say that in the run up to while we were finalizing the registration of this um, event, because of A Tale of Three Cities, we were so mindful about the right wording to use 
and we were going back and forward about what having borderline personality disorder in in um, comms and that was going to have and um, sadly it Adrian and not sadly Adrian and myself were going back and forward about the right wording um, and then sadly um, the um, Royal College um, advert came out um, referencing to people with BPD as a thorn in your side and uh, Adrian giving his due um, straight away um, was really um, apologetic to everyone as hopefully you will have seen on social media and it, I think it was very sincere so Adrian can I quickly bring you in uh, to briefly talk about that and then you to continue the rest of this webinar please. Thank you so much, Marsha, for that uh, introduction and all you've done to bring us together today. You're, you were the inspiration behind this event and the inspiration behind Borderline Personality Disorder Awareness Month and doing all, all the activities that you've got planned uh, around that. And I'm absolutely delighted to be part of this uh, webinar today and particularly to be supporting Borderline Personality Disorder Awareness Month. We need to do much more to support people with borderline personality disorder and to make sure that they uh, are, are dealt with with the, it, with the respect that they uh, deserve and get the care and services that they um, that they need. So uh, I um, I just really wanted to to just uh, say that uh, to reiterate the apology uh, about the, um, the 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 ad advert that went out for the uh, training event on uh, personality disorder, and I was shocked when I uh, saw it. Uh, I, I, I couldn't believe it was correct, uh, to, to be honest, and uh, I know that it caused a lot of hurt and distress, particularly for, for those with lived experience, and it justifiably, it, um, it, 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 it uh, sows the, the seeds of mistrust, or it, it, um, it, you know, it, 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 it adds further to the mistrust that's already there, because people are thinking, is this what all psychiatrists and all professionals uh, think of us. And the one thing that you need when you're very distressed and you need uh, help and support, you it, that starts with trust. So I really want to apologize for that. I, 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 I'll say a little bit more later on about what we're gonna do about that, but uh, I unreservedly apologize. It shouldn't have, have happened and I think one of the things that I was encouraged about is that every psychiatrist I met was uh, uh, was appalled by it uh, as as well. So I uh, just wanted to to say that uh, we we know that uh, people who are experiencing suicidal thoughts that's incredibly uh, distressing, and we need to make sure that everybody who's experiencing those thoughts that they're treated with compassion and that people are not criminalized. And we're going to hear from our speakers about how this can be criminalized, what actually happens to people, people with lived experience of, of this, and most importantly, what we can do about it so that we can make sure that we, we can uh, treat people with dignity and respect and make sure we can get people the care and treatment they need as soon as possible. Thank so- you. Thank um, you, Adrian. Thank you for that. <laughs> And I just uh, and so I just remind you that we we will have a Q and A at the end, and you can post your questions in the uh, uh, in, in the Q and A box, and then we will pick them up uh, later on. I'm delighted that now looking down, we've got 326 participants, so it shows how important this uh, this topic is. And we know that we had, I think, about 850 people signed up to it. So there is a real, um, a real need uh, uh, to for us to share our ideas around um, uh, this area of work and work together uh, in a co-produced way to make sure that the future is much better than it has been uh, in the past. So I'm now going to pass over to our first two speakers, 
And uh, first speaker is, is Dr. Alex uh, Thompson. Uh, Alex is a consultant liaison psychiatrist and uh, vice chair of the Royal College Liaison Faculty. Uh, he works at uh, Northwick Park uh, Hospital and he is a, a former psychiatric educator of the year in 2020. So congratulations uh, to, you, to you, Alex, uh, for that. And Alex is going to talk about how is distress criminalised? And then he's going to pass over to M McAllister, patient representative on the uh, Royal College Liaison faculty. Um, M has done a, a huge amount of work in, in sharing her lived experience, advising such bodies as the Care Quality Commission, Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary, the Fire and Rescue uh, Services, and she co-organized and then also presented at the Liaison Psychiatry webinar series, which provided 29 hours of free webinars featuring 86 speakers. So um, thank you to both of you for all the work that you've done in this area. And I'll now pass uh, uh, over to you. Thank you very much. And while I put my slides up, can I just check that my microphone's on and you can all hear me? Yep, you're all good, Alex. Brilliant. Okay, thanks. So thanks very much. It's a real honour to be talking at the, one of the um, the college members webinars and uh, this section between um, my talk and Dr McAllister's talk has uh, three sections. Um, first of all, we'll explain what is meant by the criminalisation of distress and what criminal sanctions are applied in the UK to people who've self-harmed, attempted suicide or disclosed suicidal ideation. Um, next, I will discuss the ethical and clinical duties of psychiatrists in this area. And then I will hand over to Dr McAllister, who will describe her lived experience of this practice being applied to her. Now, as an ongoing aspect of contemporary practice, this can be an uncomfortable topic for psychiatrists to consider. When we've spoken on this topic, we found that sometimes it can be conflated with other issues. So it's necessary to define what we will not be considering and then move on to what we will be considering. Um, firstly, people may ask, well, what about people that are suicidal and also commit violent offences? Now, criminal justice response to violence perpetrated by people with mental disorders is an important topic and needs separate consideration. And it's important that we don't conflate it with the topic of criminal sanctions applied to people who have tried to harm themselves, attempted suicide or disclosed uh, suicidal ideation. Another issue raised is exceptionalism, the idea that criminal sanctions may only rarely be applied to suicidal patients in the most extreme cases when all other attempts at providing care and treatment have been exhausted. Um, and looking at paying attention to this area, it, this is not the case in practice. Even if it were the case, healthcare professionals' recommendations must still be held to the same professional and ethical standards of duty towards one patient and the likely harms and benefits. Um, also, I think it's important to point out that the duties of a doctor and the duties of a police officer or the courts are different, and so we'll be approaching the session from the perspective of healthcare professionals. So a bit about the law. Suicide and attempting suicide used to be criminal offences in most of the UK under the common law doctrine of fellow de se, which is Latin for a crime against oneself. Until the 19th century, people who died by suicide could be punished posthumously by denial of burial and by forfeiture of their estate. And until the mid 20th century, people who attempted suicide could be punished by imprisonment. In England, Northern Ireland and Wales, this offence was decriminalised by a specific statute in the 1960s. In Scotland, there is still a common law offence of suicidal breach of the peace, although following a 2009 appeal court judgment, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service has advised Police Scotland to limit arrest and charging to cases where there is a public element, such as where a suicidal person attempts to jump from a bridge and to attempt to use mental health law and other dispositions in most other cases. Despite this apparent decriminalisation, police and judicial systems have continued to arrest, charge and prosecute people following suicide attempts. There's no systematic monitoring or reporting in this area, 
And that means that most of what we know comes from newspaper articles or from the few people who have been willing to speak publicly about their own experiences of these sort of practices. And what we know from these reports is that the practice does persist today across the UK. Um, the four headlines on this slide or articles have, have been taken from Wales, England, Scotland over a 15 year period. And uh, we've come across many more published examples of uh, similar cases. Now, around 20 years or so ago, community criminal orders were introduced in the UK. As with prosecution, these have also been applied to people who've attempted suicide, who've called emergency services disclosing suicidal thoughts, or about whom healthcare staff have contacted emergency services. Breach of a community protection notice can result in punishment by a fine. Breach of an antisocial behaviour order or a criminal behaviour order can result in punishment by either a fine or up to five years imprisonment. Now, from the descriptions of these orders that you can read, it's difficult to conceive how the conditions and sanctions can be considered appropriate if you have untreated or enduring mental health needs of such severity that you want to harm or kill yourself. Uh, but this appears to be justified by focusing on your behaviour rather than considering your emotional experience and focusing on the potential alarm that you might cause to onlookers, emergency services or healthcare staff. Um, community orders of this type have been criticised in the legal literature for amounting to a form of individualised criminal law, which can be applied to individual people without the safeguard of parliamentary scrutiny and for potentially reintroducing suicide as a criminal offence. Now, these are some examples that I've come across of conditions imposed by community orders in relation to self-harm and suicidality. And bear in mind that breaching any of these conditions could result in a fine or up to five years imprisonment. Now, although the specific offence of attempting suicide has been decriminalised in most of the UK, people are still prosecuted for associated alleged offences, which often involve framing the person's distress, self-harm or help seeking in the terms of an existing criminal offence. And then once charged, bail conditions can be used to set requirements, for example, allowing police officers into, into your house at any time of the day or night, or attending hospital at any time that a police officer asks you to. Any breach of these bail conditions, again, can result in you being imprisoned on remand while you await trial. Now I'd like to turn to the clinical ethical duties of psychiatrists and other healthcare professionals when faced with situations where it's suggested that a prosecution or a community order might be applied um, to a patient as a response to suicide, suicidality, self-harm or suicide attempts. I've structured this part in the format of a systematic review. We've already described the intervention, so now I'll discuss the apparent rationales for this practice responsibilities of doctors and other healthcare professionals from professional and ethical perspectives, a little about current clinical guidance, and then what we need to consider when weighing up the benefits and harms and describe why this is important and relevant to us all. So in the UK, over 6,000 people die by suicide every year. Many more receive medical attention for self-harm, suicide attempts and suicidal thoughts and self-harm and suicidal ideation are very heterogeneous states associated with a wide range of mental disorders and also with a wide range of social adversities. There's an additive effect. When you have a mental disorder, you are more at risk of adversity, marginalization and discrimination. And these adversities are risk factors for the development or the exacerbation of mental disorders. If we're considering the use of criminal sanctions as an intervention for self-harm or suicidality, then it's necessary to consider the practice in the same framework as any other intervention, be it psychotherapy, pharmacotherapy, a complex service intervention. Essentially, this boils down to an examination of whether the potential benefits or the observed benefits outweigh the harms. So a complex intervention, we also need to consider, does it have face validity and does it have a plausible mechanism? Arguments advanced for in this area include criminal sanctions as a necessary deterrent to prevent self-harm or suicide attempts, the application of punishment as part of a behaviour modification approach, 
provision of compulsory treatment using criminal law in preference to the use of mental health law, or as a last resort, remand to prison for your own protection if it has not been possible to secure access to evidence-based or recommended mental health treatment. With this in mind, we can also consider national and international guidance on this matter. So in 2014, the World Health Organization published a report examining the issue of criminal sanctions as a potential deterrent to suicide. They found no evidence that decriminalizing suicidal behaviors leads to an increase in suicide rates. And they published a, a second report last year, an international implementation guide for suicide prevention, which describes the criminalization of suicide attempts as seriously hampering the implementation of their recommended international public health measures and interventions. The International Association for Suicide Prevention has a similar policy position to the World Health Organization. They describe the criminalization of attempted suicide as undermining national and international suicide prevention efforts and impeding access to care. Among other national UK bodies, NHS England has expressed concern about this practice. This has come in the context of other concerns about an intervention developed for patients who have had repeated contact with the police called Serenity Integrated Mentoring or SIM. And in response to a campaign group called the Stop SIM Coalition, NHS England has asked all NHS trusts to conduct a review of such schemes. And I understand that a statement on this topic is in preparation. Yet despite these national and international recommendations, we have encountered cases in the UK where health professionals have continued to endorse or to accept such practices and uh, perhaps just see what's happening and go along with it. So I'd like everyone here to perhaps reflect on this situation now. When we are faced with this situation in our clinical practice, how should we act? Is it a matter of considering on a case by case basis what recommendation to make or are there principles and evidence which should underpin our decision making? We can start by going back to our ethical standards and our ethical frameworks and our professional standards. Um, the General Medical Council's overarching principle for doctors is you must make the care of your patient your first concern. Um, Nurses, allied health professionals have similar principles and our college's supplement to the GMC guidance of good psychiatric practice emphasizes the need to consider the ethical, implementation, the, the ethical implications of any of our recommendations. If we consider a medical eth ethics framework, there are four broad principles. Respect for autonomy, emphasizes the need to avoid coercive interventions wherever possible. The principle of beneficence requires that health professionals only endorse or perform treatments or interventions which have a reasonable likelihood of improving clinical outcomes for the patient. While the principle of non-maleficence requires the avoidance of treatments or interventions likely to cause harm, particularly if they're likely to cause more harm than good. The principle of justice includes notions of fairness, equality, and non-discrimination. So in terms of where we should stand and what we need to consider, both our professional standards and ethics frameworks emphasize that we must protect the interests of our patient, only recommend actions where the likely benefit outweighs the likely harm, and treat all patients equally. <clears throat> so what benefits and what harms should healthcare professionals consider? The primary purpose of an intervention should be an improvement in clinical outcomes. For example, improvement in symptoms of a mental disorder, alleviation of suffering, reduction in suicidality or self-harm, improvements in interpersonal, social, occupational functioning, and improvements in quality of life. There are a number of potential adverse outcomes which must be considered in relation to the use of prosecution or community orders for alleged offences related to um, suicide attempts or self-harm. Rather than deterring self-harm or suicide, the use of criminal sanctions may deter help-seeking and lead to continued suffering 
in the absence of treatment or support, which potentially increases the frequency of self-harm and the likelihood of suicide. If you're labelled as a criminal rather than a person in need, your mental health services might end up being withdrawn with consequent deterioration in your mental health. If you have conditions forbidding emergency service contact, this is likely to deter you from seeking help or contacting the police when you are a victim of a crime, which may expose you to a heightened risk of community violence or abuse. Criminalisation and imprisonment, including in police custody is inherently traumatic and harmful, associated with a loss of dignity and significant shame. It's an independent risk factor for suicide. There may also be another number of other social harms, not least that those of us who have a professional registration may also face professional conduct proceedings, even if any charges only relate to having attempted suicide when we were unwell. So why do we need to pay attention to this topic? There are currently people in the UK with mental disorders who have been imprisoned for alleged offences related to self-harm and suicidality and others that are subject to community orders. Now, we're aware, again, from researching and from clinical practice of reports of serious harm being caused, including death, permanent disability, lasting psychological injury, and a failure to recognise and address contemporary institutional abuse in mental health services. We don't know how frequently these measures are used, but we do know that there are regular reports of these practices, which are likely to be the tip of a much larger iceberg. So to justify the continued use of an intervention which carries such a risk of severe harm, we would need to be confident of unequivocal evidence of benefit for the majority of patients to which this practice is applied. And certainly I can say that so far we've not encountered any evidence of such benefit. So what do we need to do as psychiatrists? First of all, we need to be aware of this issue. We need to ensure that our colleagues are aware. We need to pay attention to what's happening locally and whether there are any discussions or recommendations about prosecution or community orders for individual patients. In each of these cases, we need to consider our position from a clinical framework of benefits and harms and make our position clear. And if you're not sure what to do on an individual level, this may involve engagement and discussion with your local clinical ethics committees. From a research position, it's important that we urgently clarify what we know about the outcomes. Dr McAllister and I are part of a group conducting a scoping review of existing literature. And I'm afraid I don't have any results to show you today, but for those of you attending the college's International Congress in Edinburgh this year, we will be presenting preliminary results in a session there. For professional bodies, there's also a need to examine practice in this area. And it's vital that any such work planned from this point forward is co-produced with people who have lived experience of being prosecuted or imprisoned and involves and considers people across the UK who are currently affected by these practices. We will also need to engage with the legal professions and the police, but overall at this stage we need clear recommendations for psychiatrists and other clinical staff. I'm going to hand over at this stage to our next speaker. Thank you, Alex. Hello, my name is, um, in my day job, I do a lot of talks and for reasons I'm not going to focus on today, this is one of the hardest I've done. But I'm glad to be here because although it's hard and involves risk to me, I think it's important that you hear it. I want to share with you a series of snapshots, moments in time that tell a story about the criminalization of distress it isn't going to be comfortable, but it shouldn't be. The pictures I've used are mostly images relating to my contact with the criminal justice system. Texts from police, calling cards left at my flat, tweets to or about me by the police. A few are images that represent where I was. I'm known when I talk for using beautiful pictures. There are none here, 
because nothing about this has beauty. The first snapshot I wanted to share with you is in the 1990s in London. My first experience of the criminalization of mental health was when as a young person, I ran away from an abusive children's mental health ward for children with eating disorders. The police were called, found me and took me back there. I was driven back to the abuse, locked in a police car. If you've experienced police and other institutions not being safe during your life, you don't need this pause for reflection. But if you were lucky enough to grow up believing that police and hospitals are always there to care and help, then you do need it. Because people who've experienced unfair or oppressive or abusive contact with the state, or who are in minoritized groups who are more likely to, don't experience police and state contact in the same way as you. That's really important for you to understand in understanding the profound harms of the criminalization of distress. I was lucky. Despite institutional abuse and police contact before I was even old enough to sit GCSEs, I got back to a place that meant I could go to university. I won prizes and took scholarships abroad. I have severe OCD, and although it affected me a lot, there were things in my life that were good, worth holding on to. I'm glad I didn't know then how hard that would be. The second snapshot is in Scotland. I was at work and had recently reached out for some mental health help. I'd been referred to the CMHT and had seen the psychiatrist a few times. I'd received an appointment letter. It clashed with my theatre list. I called in advance to say I couldn't attend and left a voicemail. Thinking that was the end of it, I carried on working and hours later came home. On approaching my street, a scene unfolded. My neighbours were gathered around my house. There were police cars, a fire engine and police wearing high vis. One of the police was atop a ladder, peering into my housemate's bedroom window. I asked my neighbour what was going on. He told me that the police had told them all that the mental health team had called police to do a concern for welfare check on the girl who lives in that house, me. It later turned out the mental health team had thought that my voice sounded distorted. My psychiatrist was off sick. And so rather than send a mental health team member inquiring with me, the police were sent instead. This scene might seem a bit comical, no harm done, perhaps you think. But if you're unlucky enough to be mentally unwell, and not receive the right help, the criminalization that occurs in the UK doesn't stop here. In the next snapshot, I'm on a trolley in A&E, face down, my hands cuffed, pushed up behind my back in leg restraints. Two police officers are holding my face down onto the vinyl mattress. I'd been in that position for two hours. People die in this type of restraint. Immediately, you're probably thinking violence, but the only violence was perpetrated against me. I have never been violent or threatening to another person. I've never even been accused of that. So how does this happen? I'd called the crisis team earlier in the evening. My OCD had been untreated for a very long time. The services I was seeing hadn't recognized it as OCD. They'd formulated, taken a different route, one that left me adrift with a treatable but untreated mental health condition. On this day, I had explained I was afraid I was contaminated and somehow caused harm to others through that contamination. The crisis house, as is their practice in my area where there's self-harm or perceived risk, had again called police. Who'd found me with chemical burns from trying to decontaminate myself, had panicked and taken me to hospital. The more they touched me, the more frightened I became that I had contaminated them. There were no psychiatrists who came to the emergency department that day. Where I live, if you attend more than once, you probably won't be seen by psychiatry. Welfare checks are very far from neutral. Welfare checks criminalize. They don't come with any of the protections of the Mental Health Act. Welfare checks expose patients to violence, risk of harm and risk of death. They are very, very serious and often don't result in any help. I sometimes hear people in UK psychiatry crow about how mechanical restraint isn't used in psychiatry here. It is used in the name of mental health care every single day. Four, another welfare check. 
This time, I came home to find my door smashed and a calling card from police from a welfare check. Marks on your door on the card was a euphemism for the door being broken into two sections. Do you know how much emergency fitting for a new front door costs? How many have you purchased? I stopped counting after three. When I was unwell, at one point, I was left with a front door that didn't close for months. I wasn't well enough to arrange to sort it out. That doesn't help your mental health. Eventually, police became so desperate, they left me the second card, trying to encourage me to call police for support. It's very lucky that I didn't. If I had, I might not be here talking to you today. You'll see why later. Five. I'm in the cage of a police van. I'm curled in the metal footwell. My blood is on the metal bench and the bars of the van because I'm coughing up blood. The hemoptysis is because I'm treated. My OCD has got so much worse that I've now got an inhalational injury from the chemicals I'm trying to decontaminate myself with. Police have been called for another welfare check as I've been seen bleeding in the street. Over the years, I have experienced dozens. Most times the police have not even used the mental health back. Act. I've been coerced to hospital as a voluntary patient. A voluntary patient carried like a package in leg straps and handcuffs. In the four years until 2018, I was taken to A&E 133 times. I was seen by anyone from mental health services on fewer than 5% of those attendances, and I had no ongoing mental health care. The pause I want to ask you to take here is to go beyond physical risk and understand the psychological experience of being with police for many hours in A&E. Once a welfare check has commenced, police stay until you're either seen by psychiatry or discharged. Have you ever tried to use a toilet wearing handcuffs? Now imagine it with the toilet door open. Police don't allow you to close it. In my local A&E, this exposes you to the whole of majors. Everyone can see. Once in this no man's land between psychiatry and criminal justice, you're not human. There are few rights, few protections, and no dignity. Six, and I'm in ICU. My OCD had deteriorated more. I'd come to believe the only way I could protect people from contamination was by being dead. After intubation, ventilation, I woke to a blur of high vis. Even though my contact lenses had been taken out, I knew it would be police by my bed. In the UK, with untreated mental illness, police can be a constant. One police officer in ICU desperately tried to plead with a psychiatrist to help me. The police had changed shifts for three days while I was unconscious, as there had been a decision by police that I must be assessed by psychiatry. The police were so concerned they weren't prepared to leave until I had been seen. I still was not seen. Months later, I met the officer again, and he told me that the psychiatrist had made a complaint about his pleas to help, that he had been made to go to the hospital to apologise in person to the psychiatrist who didn't see me. I was dying in plain sight while mental health services and police conducted a turf war. Any compassion, whoever showed it, was punished. Seven. I'm naked in a police cell. I was arrested when the burns unit wouldn't admit me without site clearance and psych wouldn't see me. Police have been called by mental health services to do a welfare check yet again. And this time they believed arresting me would be safer than letting me leave. I was arrested on a charge that was read to me as to prevent a breach of the peace after many hours sitting quietly on a trolley in A&E. At arrest, I had burns, dressings and clothing. On arrest, these were all deemed a ligature risk. I was transported to cells, restrained face down, stripped, including dressings removed, and left naked. A few moments later, a paper anti-rip suit was posted through the hatch in the cell. Eight, a camera flash. Back in the police station a second time, months later, with my prisoner details being processed, Fingerprints, cheek swab DNA, photo against the wall with the measurements. Is your DNA in the National Police Database? Would you want it to be? Become unwell like I did and not receive help and you won't have a choice. 
I had called the crisis team who'd called police as they thought I might self-harm. Police had taken me to the mental health hospital. There was a long queue to be assessed. A nurse who didn't come out to see me or speak with me said I had capacity and to let me leave. So the police let me go. I was seen by police later that night walking the city frightened and was arrested. Nine, in the cells at court the next day. And these are the cells that I was in. After a day in police cells, I had been charged with a series of offences, breach of the peace, wasting police time and culpable and reckless conduct. If convicted, those could carry a sentence of 10 years in prison. The last offence was unknown to me at the time because an acting inspector at the police had decided to allege that it was me who had called police 24 times over the previous year for welfare checks, saying that I had deprived others of a police service. I had never called police for a welfare check, but now I was at court so unwell with my OCD that I thought it might be because I had killed somebody. The prosecution asked for me to be remanded to prison. 10, many months later in my solicitor's office, I hadn't been remanded, but I had been nearly destroyed by the court process. Proving I hadn't called the police was easy for my solicitor. For him to convince the system that I shouldn't be in the criminal justice system, much harder. The case cost me almost everything I had. I came close to death. And here I was in the office, reading mental health notes my solicitor had obtained. He'd called me in, wanting me to see them, because he said he was concerned for me. There was danger, and there it was, in writing. Mental health staff from local mental health services had encouraged and endorsed my prosecution. It's hard to describe the impact this has, the fundamental breach of the social contract. When we're well, maybe we hope for healthcare. Even where our human right to healthcare is restricted, we may be hoped for fair treatment. We do not expect the systems designed to help us to punish us. We do not expect to be punished for mental illness. I was going to stop here. I didn't want you to have a neat ending because there's nothing neat about what was done to me. The criminalization of illness lost me my job. It encouraged devastating professional conduct proceedings and worse. I very nearly didn't make it, but a friend persuaded me to tell you the next part, which is 10 here today. After years of criminalization, what stopped it? Actual treatment for my OCD. I started first line OCD treatment, sertraline 200 milligrams in 2018, and I haven't been to A&E with self-harm since. I had a treatable mental illness that responded significantly to first line therapy. Psychiatry isn't the savior in this story though, with a very few honorable exceptions, notably the psychiatrist who acted pro bono for me for my defense at court and the psychiatrist who diagnosed my OCD and stood up for me in accessing treatment. This type of criminalization has devastating lifelong effects that I and those who care for me will never recover from. There was life before, and then there is what remains after this. Every time mental health staff called police for a welfare check, every time psychiatry didn't come to A&E, the psychiatrist locally who refused to assess me for court, all of the mental health professionals who witnessed what was going on over many years and did nothing. Psychiatry is marked mostly in this story by its absence and its silence. You might think my story is extreme, but there's nothing extreme and nothing complex about me. Police are left filling gaps in the mental health system every day, and police have very limited tools to respond. After a few checks where they attempt compassion and listening, eventually they're left with the same tools as they used for arresting and punishing criminals. The escalation, the welfare checks, the restraint, the cage vans, the leg straps, handcuffs, cheek swabs, strip searches, face down restraint, anti-rip suits, cells and prosecution, all chart a course through the criminalization of distress that takes us back to where we were when suicide and attempted suicide were criminal offenses. That is the direction the UK has taken. I've tried to mention in this talk a few of the similarities between us, my training, 
from my background. If this isn't, hasn't happened to you or your family, the difference between us may only be that you haven't had the unmet mental health need I have and have nobody come to help. But none of that should matter. Yes, this could happen to you or people you love, but that it happens to anyone, no matter their diagnosis or background should matter to all of us. Psychiatry is one of the few professions with the scope to act decisively on this. I have diagnostic privilege with OCD. It's less stigmatized than BPD, but I felt I should speak today because of what has been done to me and because of what we know about BPD stigma. If this happened to me, what is happening to others? Maybe future, more compassionate societies will judge us. They'll wonder how we stood by. You might think that you don't see this, but that's the problem. This happened in a lacunae where psychiatry was largely absent in a relatively well-resourced city at a university teaching hospital. If you don't agree with this, don't want it to happen on your watch, don't want this to be a legacy of your generation of psychiatrists, some of those who weren't there, who didn't see it, need to act. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. McAllister, for that really very powerful uh, testimony. And um, it, it already one of the comments from Anupama uh, is that it, it was hard to listen to, must have been incredibly difficult to, to tell your story um, with unfathomable uh, pain. And so thank you for your generosity in, in doing that. And thank you, um, Dr. Thompson, uh, for taking us through the, the legal side and the, the evidence base around this. We'll, there, there's lots of questions already, and we'll come back to discuss some of the issues that have been raised. But I wanted now to pass over to Sarah Skett. Sarah is the leader of the Offender Personality Disorder Pathway Team from NHS England and Her Majesty's Prison and uh, Probation Service. And uh, Sarah's got the overall uh, um, responsibility for the strategic direction of the program. And she's going to talk about the offender personality disorder pathway. So Sarah, over to you, and then we'll come back to uh, Q&A. Thank you very much. Hopefully people can hear me okay. Yeah, we can. Yes. Yeah, excellent stuff, excellent stuff. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. It's quite an honour to be asked to come and speak to you at an event such as this. Um, and I'm, I'm still trying to process what we've just heard from M um, and trying to, to follow a, a presentation like that, of course, is going to be very difficult. Um, it, it, absolutely, the, the, the trauma and the pain that M has described is unfathomable. And um, it's, I can't quite get to grips with the fact that that is still happening and that is that somebody's truth and potentially um, replicated many times over. Um, Marsha asked, asked me to come and speak to you today um, to talk about the offender personality disorder pathway. Now, of course, I'm coming at this now from completely the other end of the spectrum uh, where I'm trying to provide services and work with staff um, for, for people who have indeed committed offences and who have, in some cases, committed very serious offences, so serious violence and, and serious sexual offences. Um, I think it's very important to acknowledge that it is rare. Um, so homicides, serious violence and serious sexual offences are rare and it is even rarer for people to uh, commit those offences who have a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. However, having said that, when we work with the people uh, who are part of our, um, our pathway, who uh, meet the criteria to um, be included in our pathway, the two major um, likely diagnoses that people could have, and I'll, I'll come on to that in a moment because we don't diagnose really in the pathway, but the two major diagnoses that people could receive if they were diagnosed 
are indeed borderline personality disorder and antisocial personality disorder, or sometimes people would satisfy the diagnosis for both of those. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So just a little bit about what the offender personality disorder pathway is. Um, it is very small and it is a program. So the idea of it is to try and test new ways of delivering services. And it's a program that is jointly delivered by the NHS and by HMPPS, so Her Majesty's Prison and Probation Services. Most of the money actually comes from the NHS but the services are delivered mainly in the criminal justice system. The programme as we know it today was launched in 2011. Uh, and as you can see from the second uh, point on the slide, the programme is actually for people who are deemed to be high risk or very high risk of harmful offending, future harmful offending. We've got far more men who satisfy the criteria than we have women. Um, but what's incredibly interesting to note and something which I do try to raise and discuss many, many times um, is that the men who are screened into the pathway exhibit borderline personality disorder symptomology, but have never received a diagnosis or indeed even been considered that that is a possibility. And eventually things deteriorate and they end up in prison. Um, so I believe there to be a gender disparity there uh, for, for men in particular who don't necessarily seek help um, and end up in prison because their offending then uh, unfortunately uh, attracts a custodial sentence. Um, the four aims of the programme, as you can see there, is to try and address or reduce the harm for reoffending and very importantly to increase psychological well-being. Uh, what we try to do is to work with people to provide a mental health service that is addressing that very complex mental health need that people are presenting with um, and at the same time try and understand if there is a relationship with the offending and if there is a relationship with it to try to work out what's going on and to address that jointly. Um, another element of the um, OPD pathway which is incredibly important is to work with staff. Um, I'm very struck, I think, by Em's presentation about the police officers who were, were trying to be helpful but didn't quite know what to do and were not left with any, any real um, options about how, how to help. Uh, and what we're trying to do in the OPD pathway is to provide lots of training and lots of um, help and consultancy to staff in the criminal justice system so that they do indeed understand and are able to um, work appropriately and work compassionately with people who may exhibit um, the very complex mental health problems or distress and emotional uh, issues that perhaps goes along with borderline personality disorder or antisocial personality disorder. Um, so staff development, staff training, very, very important part of the programme, as is staff supervision um, to help people make sense of um, perhaps difficult behaviour that they may be met with or behaviour that they don't understand to try and help people make sense of that in the context of um, these very complex um, emotional and uh, relational difficulties that people have. Next slide, please. Um, this is a very, very busy slide. I'm not going to go into huge amounts of detail, but pinpoint a couple of things, I think, which are important to recognise. So where did the OPD pathway come from? Well, some of you may remember um, the Dangerous and Severe Personality Disorder Initiative, which was a governmental response. Of course, Dangerous and Severe Personality Disorder is not a clinical term. There is no evidence to suggest that it is a thing or that it is something that can be diagnosed. But that's where our journey starts with the OPD pathway. Um, lots of money was pumped into DSPD services. Um, and eventually the Bradley Review in 2009 um, recommended that actually we needed to do much, much better, that those DSPD services weren't really delivering what was uh, required. 
Um, they were too exclusive. There were not enough of them. There was no pathway of care. Um, and it, it simply wasn't um, identifying people early enough to be able to help them uh, early enough in, in their uh, treatment journey. So 2009, the Bradley Review directly led then to the OPD pathway being started in 2011. And from then, as you can see, we've got some cogs there, labelled pipes, um, strategies, uh, co-commissioning uh, activity and so on. So lots of services were then put in place across the criminal justice system to try and provide evidence based treatment for people who had indeed found their way into the criminal justice system, but required uh, mental health services or services that addressed these um, you know, very complex um, interpersonal problems uh, using an evidence based um, uh, strategy. And that needed to be delivered alongside understanding their offending behaviour. Um, so jump forward to 2018, the NHS is 70 and the OPD pathway did actually receive a little bit more money to invest more services uh, along the pathway. Various other bits and pieces, which I, I won't go into on this slide, um, which have then uh, developed over time. And we are now in 2022 in a position to um, refresh the original strategy in 2015 and think about the next five years, about what we need to do now uh, in order to take forward our services, take forward the evidence base um, and to deliver what I would describe as relational compassionate services um, for people who are in the criminal justice system. Um, just in the top corner there, we, we've got a couple of things there which show you the disproportionate um, prevalence of likely personality disorder in a criminal justice population. So the Singleton research in 1998, incredibly old now, 25 years ago that was done, um, demonstrated that if people were diagnosed, you were looking at rates of around 64% uh, in a sentence population to 78% in a remand population. Those people that could potentially satisfy a diagnosis of personality disorder. I believe the, um, the prevalence rate in the community is around 5%. Um, so very clearly, criminal justice um, has, uh, um, it's vastly overrepresented over uh, people with, the, with difficulties in this domain. And we've got to ask ourselves, why? Why do people end up in prison where they very clearly have a mental health issue, um, which perhaps had that been diagnosed earlier or caught earlier, may well have um, diverted that individual from the offending that got them into prison in the first place. Next slide, please. Um, again, very busy slide. I won't go into a lot of detail on this, but this really is just to illustrate the breadth of services that we uh, are trying to deliver now across uh, the criminal justice system. What you can see on this slide is that we've got the aims of the pathway across uh, around the outside in the four corners. So reducing harmful reoffending, increasing psychological health and well-being, uh, developing the workforce and delivering things um, uh, efficiently. Uh, so those are our main objectives. We always have to think about public protection and risk management. So that underpins what we do. Um, but what we try to do across the pathway is to put in place evidence based uh, treatment, um, including things like enabling environments, which is a Royal College of Psychiatrists initiative to try to uh, make sure that all of our services have a fundamental basis in enabling. Um, we've got things like therapeutic communities, we've got psychologically informed planned environments. The whole thing is underpinned by uh, psychological formulation and a psychological understanding of a person's difficulties um, with a view to help staff and help the people understand their stories, their histories, why have they uh, ended up in the situation that they're in, and most importantly then to plan a pathway of care out of that. Um, it's a complicated pathway, it's getting more and more complicated all the time, uh, but it is something which I think we are beginning to see an impact both from uh, our service users who have, um, you know, experience and tell us that they've, they've, for the first time, that they've received some kind of care which is beginning to help 
and also to the staff uh, in terms of the training and the development that they're receiving and the supervision that they're receiving, um, which is also helping them understand and put a completely different reflection on um, the behaviour that they have tried to manage in the past and they have not fully understood. So we feel we're on the right lines, a long way to go, a lot more evidence, I think, to deliver lots more evaluation to do. Um, but onwards to the next five years. Um, next slide, please. These are the things that we know we need to focus on over the next five years. We want to really double down on service quality. We want to make sure uh, that as far as we can, we are delivering evidence-based interventions and that we are helping staff understand um, the services that they're delivering and they have or feel that they have the competency and the capability to deliver what they need to do. Very important to think about therapeutic preservation, particularly in a criminal justice um, population. Prisons, as you might imagine, are not therapeutic by design, and we are constantly trying to introduce therapeutic ideas, enabling environments, um, compassionate treatment into prison and probation practice, because we genuinely believe that that has to be the way to go. That's got to be something that underpins how we deal with, with the people in our care. We know that we've got a lot of complexity in the populations that we are trying to um, provide a service for, uh, that and we're not really reaching some people, I think. We're not providing services that are um, delivering the right things for some of those populations, and we need to look at that. We need to address that. We need to continue to make the pathway more robust. We need to think about transitions, transitions being very problematic, I think, for some people. Um, and also the possibility that pathways are interrupted, the pathways of care are not delivered appropriately. We firmly believe that relational practice is a tool um, to really help everybody move forward, uh, both with those people who are likely to satisfy a diagnosis, but also for the staff. Always evaluating, always learning and trying to add value um, into the criminal justice system to make sure that we're addressing or delivering the needs and delivering the objectives that we've got. I think that's the last slide. Um, I'm going to stop there um, and hand back to the chair. Well, thanks very much, uh, Sarah. That was uh, very clear. And thanks for all the, the work that you have put into providing those services. So uh, we'll now move to uh, the uh, Q&A. And uh, there are a lot of comments in the uh, in in the Q and A. People can see those uh, openly, and I think the, uh, the 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 comments really mostly uh, about M's presentation, how powerful it was, compelling testimony. Um, Abigail says, you know, that uh, hopefully that your bravery will pave the way for others to speak up and to help bring about change. And that's really what we what we want to really come from from this. Uh, webinar and from the work that uh, that we're doing. Uh, I We've got about uh, 15 minutes, we'll probably run until 20 past, so we're slightly overrun. And uh, there's a the first question is really about the, the audience here, really, who are the people we've got to influence? And an uh, anonymous uh, attendee says, the webinar is directed largely at an audience of psychiatrists and healthcare professionals, but most of the decisions as to whether to criminalize people with borderline personality disorder in distress are made by people such as NHS management and police. Uh, how do we help in those situations? And Marsha, I think you, uh, you wanted to, to answer that question. Um, so thank you for the question. Um... I'm someone who has borderline personality disorder and still under secondary mental health services. And I had an experience uh, in September last year with the police. Um, and it was because of um, my care um, workers. I wouldn't engage with them and in the end. And then they, the police, there was the welfare checks and that I've not been, I, I can't even begin to imagine everything that M's been through and, um, I really, all I can say is sending you hugs and thank you so, so, so much for telling your story. And like, yeah, I, I just don't have the words, but um, to answer Anonymous's question, um, 
so for me the the little meant that I got that therapy but it also meant that I got really stigmatizing care and I still sometimes experience it and that is why I'm trying to do what I'm doing to raise awareness around stigma and to try and bring as many people to the table as possible and that is what this tale of three cities goes global is about is to try and bring people together to actually say hang on a minute we can and we must do better and that is why Adrian we're doing this isn't it and there's this is what it's about it's not so when I partnered up with Sarah Hughes and Peter Fonagay, we acknowledged the both sides, you know, the, the label that, you know, it can get you the therapy, but it also causes harm and it excludes people and often sometimes much worse because you're deemed attention seeking too manipulative in that. I've experienced that. And I guess what when we partnered up, we wanted to get to the middle bit um, and unfortunately, because of how things are, you need a label to get the therapy, sadly. Um, but what you'll find is if you give us a chance about A Tale of Three Cities, the young people in that involved are stepping away from the medical model. They don't care what it's called. They're using art, poetry and photography as a way to bring to life what it's like, that pain not being seen as manipulative or attention seeking. So, I mean, I've never experienced anything like what you have, Em, but I have had some bad times. So just thank you so much for, uh, uh, yeah, sending hugs. Thanks for that, Marsha. And, and say, I, I do want to say how sorry I am to hear about your experience and, and that of uh, Em. And I think it's, the purpose of hearing about it is so that we can actually say, look, we, we've got to do better for the uh, for the future. I'll, I'll come to another question now, um, and that is: is the, the the sorts of things that we've heard about today? Is it is it about hiding uh, distress away from the gaze of those who control space? Uh, I don't know who wants to have a, a, a um, go at that. I don't know. M, would you be able to to answer that question? Sure, yeah, I, I think it's an interesting way to conceptualize it, to think about hiding the distress. Because actually, I think what was very clear during the years of what happened to me is that the distress was being increased and I was being made more ill. And there was no shortage of evidence on that. So multiple times the court were presented with evidence from intensive care doctors, from my GP, from others, clearly saying this is getting worse, you are making this worse. Um, the psychiatrist for the prosecution and for the defence both said things along those lines too. And yet, once this process had started, it was actually much more about punishing somebody who didn't fit. And it was about punishing somebody. And there were lots of times that people could have stopped what was happening and they didn't. And I'm not sure in my case whether that was because nobody felt they owned the process at one time, it actually felt that mental health services were relieved that I was in the criminal justice system because I was no longer their problem. And I think that was the overriding driver in what happened to me. There were some particularly nasty examples, the acting inspector who sort of extended the truth made up that I had made those calls, but essentially it was shifting a problem to another service. And my local mental health service seemed pretty happy that I was now with the police and the criminal justice system and seemed pretty happy to let me go to prison. Look, I'll move on to another um, question. And Alex, I'm gonna to come to you about this. Aren't CTOs then explained as the same where specific conditions have to be met, otherwise we recall them to hospital, i.e. incarceration, Alex? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think this is, this is a question which um, I, th I think we need to consider more because I guess that the issue is there is a difference between criminal law and mental health law. Um, and, uh, you know, particularly, I, th I think we're talking about an area where there is no public protection imperative. So our sort of secondary 
duties as doctors um, to prevent death or serious harm to others are, are not engaged. We have a primary duty to our patient. So I, I guess that the question, the thing that I, th I think we, we need to sort of consider and untangle is um, why is it that in some cases, um, a, you know, uh, imprisonment and um, punishment is considered, whereas we do have um, community treatment orders, we, we do have, um, you know, hospital orders, um, which could be made. So, so why, why are these not being used in cases where we have people, you know, who have attempted suicide? I mean, the, the one thing I'm just also mindful that, you know, the first question did say, um, what can psychiatrists do in this circumstance, you know, and um, I think while you've heard my my views, I, I work in a system where um, these questions come up and, and, and we get calls you know, from police saying we're, we're proposing to prosecute this person, we're proposing to do this. And I think actually what <clears throat> what we need is, as a profession is some clear guidance and standards and perhaps a sort of template letter that can be used as a response to this to say, um, there are safety concerns, and this is not endorsed by <clears throat> the college, it's not endorsed by uh, NICE or any good practice guidance, and not endorsed by the World Health Organization. And, and certainly that's, I think, the approach that I've used locally in a few cases is, is you know, just writing to police officers to say, <clears throat> while you appreciate there are, you know, you know, we acknowledge there are issues around access to care and treatments, you know, this is being planned and there may be some time needed to respond um but the the approach of you know prosecution or community orders as an intervention to prevent suicidality is likely to cause more harm than benefit and is not supported by any clinical practice standards okay thanks sir. alex can, can i stay with you for another question sure. which again i think you've indicated that you uh, would want, want to answer and that is how can we support the police and how can we support uh, an individual who is clearly distressed in a public place who for example is 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 is, is holding a knife and brandishing it those are that the reality <sighs> of certain situations yeah. so what what can be done how can we manage yeah. these situations better so i so i've sort of read I, th I think there's perhaps two sides to this question about sort of possession of a a knife you know and there there is a question about um you, you know someone brandishing a knife or threatening other people with a knife and um i think that that's perhaps more um the the the, the violence offenses side and the public protection side and uh you know of, of course um uh police intervention is necessary in those terms However, there have also been cases of people that have had a, a knife or a razor blade or, um, you, know, you know, a small knife in their bag or in their pocket who have been then arrested and prosecuted with possession of a bladed article um, on the, on the, you know, when they had that in their possession with, you know, it, to attempt to harm themselves because they, they want to cut themselves and there's no danger to the public. So I think there needs to be, I, th I think, a clear delineation between public protection and the, you know, perhaps differential enforcement or your selective application of um, criminal law in order to manage a, a, a risk to safety. And, um, you know, perhaps I think what we, what we need is arguably you know we're always calling for more resources in mental health services but there is a thing about how we use those resources as well and um i i think that you know perhaps i, I would suggest that do we need to call for more resources in mental health services but perhaps also a shift of um you know responsibility duties and powers to ensure that we can get mental health staff as a first line of response to non-violent mental health emergencies in public places, rather than dispatching the police as an, an arm of healthcare services. Okay, th thanks so, for that. We're coming fairly near the end. Marsh, you wanted to come in. Yeah, so um, 
I want to ask you a question. <laughs> um, so as part of a tale of three cities and all the, the um, projects that I'm doing, I am calling for systemic change from the top down. And so as part of this collaboration of Tale of Three Cities, we've got yourselves as being part of it. We've got the Mental Health Network. We've got Norman Lamb. We're looking to update the original PD consensus statement. Um, there's, there's a hell of a lot going on. And so for me, I want systemic change from the top down. I want there to be like cuff training offered every health and social care staff. Um, I also, my wish list is that you go on to the Centre for Mental Health website and check out all the stuff that we're doing in May. And after May, there's going to be so much more, isn't there? So your final word, what, what do you think that we can do together going forward with you? And so, so what do you think, what do you see going forward? Well, thanks very much, uh, Marsha. And again, thank you for, you, you've really sort of stimulated the, the session uh, today and, uh, a, a, you know, some real deep thinking and brought people together uh, around this in a very positive way, but in a way that really demands a, a response. And I, I noticed that there are questions in the chat about, you know, saying that my apology was, was in a, inadequate. You know, what are you actually going to do? And I want to respond to that in your, your question. And I think the, the two things we've agreed to do, we published a position statement where, which I think some of the actions got a bit lost in, in COVID and we need to make sure that we have resources in this area, as Alex was, was saying, uh, we need to make sure we've got care pathways, we've got to make sure we have already had discussions with, with NHS England. I know there are people all over the world who are, who are who've actually tuned into this, but so already discussions about resources, which I think are really important and haven't been there. But we have also, we've, we've agreed to commission a piece of work. It's going to be coordinated by the National Collaborating Centre for Mental Health. It's going to be a co-produced piece of work, a genuinely co-produced piece of work, looking at dignity and respect for those who have received a diagnosis of personality disorder or experiencing complex uh, in, in, uh, emotional difficulties. Uh, so looking at privacy, uh, dignity and respect, uh, looking at collective terms that are used. And I think there are more to be, I think there are times we do need to use collective terms, but we feel uncomfortable about doing so. And we need to be clear about why do we, why do we need them? What's the purpose? What are the, what are the risks involved and the harms that can involve? What are the existing collective terms that we use? Can we do better? Or do we actually need to do some more work about how we can minimize harms ar arising from them? And I think we also do need to do some work, and I, I would like to do this, uh, you know, across involving people like the police and the, the very strong feelings, that the strong emotions that for, for um, people with lived experience in this area, but also for those who are um, uh, carers, uh, professionals, or police, and actually try to help people to manage that so that they can always treat people with dignity and respect in a professional way. And I, I think we've all got to think a bit more positively about helping people because there's actually a huge evidence base around what helps. We just need to make sure that we can get that to the people that really need it. So uh, I, I, feel, I, I feel that there is a, a conversation that's really gathering momentum at the moment in a way that I feel really very positive uh, about and I'm uh, and my apology can never be enough and it, it this is about action and about delivering something that is what will really make a, a difference Chris in, in response to your your question. So thank you about this and I guess all we can do is carry on doing what we've got to do try, we've got to try harder and that because we, we've just got to haven't we and I'd like more specialist talking therapies, you know, timely. Why can't others get MBT and schema in that so that we don't reach that crisis point in that? And so I guess that's where having access to yourselves and other senior leaders in that. Um, I too am hopeful, and but there is so much to do. And so check out the Centre for Mental Health um, webpage. 
for the series of events. Um, and there will be much more after May. Um, and um, so keep an eye out for everything. And as I mentioned at the beginning, I was really anxious about being involved in this conversation because it is really emotive. And I mean, I, I think a few of us were, and um, we're, we're bringing our lived experience. We really give a damn, don't we? So thank you to M. Uh, I sincerely, I can't say anything to take away what your things are, but please know, thank you. Um, um, Sarah, thank you so, so much. And um, I look forward to um, finding out more about the next five years. Um, Alex, you carry on doing what you're doing because you really do, you just say it as it is. And Adrian, you've got a really tough job and that, but as I've said to you before, I do actually think you're a breath of fresh air. Um, and so, yeah, just thank you for your sincere, your sincereness. So um, you've let me co-chair this with you. And so it was a bit of a trust thing. So thank you so much for that. And everyone take care and um, please make sure you look after yourself. So thank you very much and take care. Thank you, Marsha. Thanks everyone.